Okay, well, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with our plenary panel, and the title is Outlook for Sustainability in the Region. Joining us, we have Trina Libera, Director of the Nature Conservancy Pacific Division. We have Albert Borja, Environmental Program Director, Naval Facilities Engineering Command. Have fun. We have Walter Leon Guerrero, Director, Guam Environmental Protection Agency. We have Nico Fujikawa, Acting Director of Tourism Research at GVB. And we have Senator John Adda, Chairman of uh, the Committee on Environment, Land, Agriculture, and Procurement Reform from the 34th Guam Legislature. Moderating this panel, we have Dr. Robert Underwood. Uh, for day. All right, I'm so glad that everybody is really keyed in on this panel. That was a great uh, uh, presentation that we heard. Uh, you know, there was a kind of a, a dimension to that, which, you know, each one here will have a, a chance to talk about uh, sustainability in the region, but there was a dimension to that uh, presentation that I found interesting, and that is uh, not to look at business as uh, just automatically on the wrong side of sustainability. Uh, in, in, in our case here, we have, uh, uh, you know, tourism, representatives of tourism, representatives uh, uh, from the military, representatives from uh, regulatory agencies, uh, and sometimes, and, and NGOs, and sometimes we think of uh, uh, our relationship with each other as adversarial, uh, not exactly on the same side, uh, and uh, so it, it, it's kind of a... Uh, I, I don't want to end up singing Kumbaya from this uh, panel. I don't, I'm not trying to move us in that direction, but I do want to kind of uh, maybe bridge a, a, a few gaps uh, along the way. So with that, uh, what we're going to do is we'll just let each one, and we'll, uh, we'll start here with Albert, and uh, we'll let each one uh, introduce themselves and what they do. And uh, well, maybe we'll start with my colleague there. We'll start on the other side. I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe I should. Uh, talk to my uh, colleague here for a long, long time. We'll start with Senator Tom Etta. Works. <laughs> Up today, uh, I'm Tom Etta, and I'm the uh, chairman for the Legislative Committee on uh, Environment, Agriculture, Land, and Procurement Reform. I'm currently serving my uh, ninth term. Uh, this would be my last year in the legislature. Uh, I want to kind of approach issues from, from a different perspective. Um, but I, my outlook on uh, sustainability, at least of Guam, uh, is, uh, I, I think, is, well, it's very positive. Uh, we certainly have uh, made a lot of progress in terms of the ports of entry and its ability to um, be very efficient in its throughput capacity. And of course, while that is good for Guam, it is also good for the neighboring islands because many of the commodities uh, get transshipped through Guam. So if we're able to do it here efficiently, uh, we can then get things moved out through the islands um, certainly a lot, a lot more efficiently. Um, we're still also making some. We're also making some progress on the unwanted uh, visitors, uh, the invasive species uh, that has plagued our island. Uh, the rhino beetles, the fire ants, and, and whatnot. And the progress that we have made is that we're actually giving a lot more uh, attention to the customs and quarantine by, uh, we've got a bill right now to actually set aside four acres of land uh, for them to be able to set up their facility uh, to be able to, to inspect things. Now further inland, uh, Guam has been making a lot of headway, especially with uh, Guam Power Authority uh, to uh, achieve a higher level of renewables in its portfolio. So by about 2021, 25% of the power that's produced uh, will be from renewables. In addition to that, uh, a new power plant uh, will soon be built, 180 megawatt, uh, which will be fully EPA compliant and a lot more efficient. Uh, we're getting uh, the treatment of our wastewater uh, will soon be going through the secondary treatment process. So as a result, the discharge out of the ocean will be a lot less impactful. 
Um, so that's underway. We got the treatment plant in the south and in the north, um, and uh, they'll be coming online pretty soon. Uh, a lot of progress has been made in getting a better handle on our solid waste management, um, it, which was under the receivership for uh, quite a number of years. And it is hoped that by this summer, uh, that responsibility will be turned over to the government of Guam. And uh, we, we certainly uh, will hope to maintain that progress that was made in that area. Uh, and of course, um, we, and then the final thing is that uh, a lot more policies are being enacted by the legislature to actually begin pushing out into the villages the stewardship of the land. So for example, in the village of Talapofo, we have uh, a, a, a quite a bit of vacant public lands. And so the mayor stepped forward and says, can I get jurisdiction of these acreages here uh, so that we can turn it in for agricultural activities for the villagers? Uh, for recreational activities and all that. So we've done that in several number of villages um, where they are, where we're pushing it down to the mayors to take control uh, of those properties. Uh, so the, it's, it's getting more decentralized now for the stewardship of the land and, um, and, and I just feel like we're, we're going in the right direction. Thank you, thank you very much. How today? My name is uh, Nico Fujikawa. I'm the acting director for tourism research at the Guam Visitors Bureau. And uh, my division, we take care of a lot of uh, visitor statistics, arrivals, a lot of the research that goes behind our marketing efforts, our marketing plans, and um, diversifying our market. And you know, looking at the tourism industry, it's a really interesting time because the tourism industry has not evolved as drastically and dramatically as it has over the past five to ten years. You see with the rise of uh, our low-cost carriers uh, from Korea, we do see a larger number of Koreans coming to Guam for the first time. And it's, it's, it's funny because at the same exact time, there's two different stories going on in the tourism industry. You have Japan who's slowly becoming more focused on inward travel, more domestic uh, growth for their economy. And you have Korea who's more focused on out outward travel because their economy's been growing over the past couple, or you know, the years before. So Guam has been fortunate to experience a drop in our primary market and a rise in a new market to make up that difference, which is why we've seen growth year over year for the past five years. Um, now we come to this point, and it's, it's a perfect timing with the Island Sustainability Conference, that we've come to this point, and I, and I projected that this year um, we'll see a tipping point. We've seen um, exponential growth from Korea helping boost all the other markets. But now it'll be a year where that growth from Korea will start to slow. And it's, you know, it's an economic cycle. You can't experience growth continuously without um, the opposite side of that coin. So this is the year where um, we'll see Korea start to slow down and those other markets are really pulling down. So now it, it's up to us as the Bureau and the island to kind of you know, rethink our strategy in terms of quantity versus quality, right? We're looking at sustainability and Yes, it's good to have growth of over bottom line numbers, but when we look at the quality of visitor and over the quantity, then we can look at sustainable tourism, and, and that's kind of the goal today. And you know, I, I'd love to talk more about it with the panel as we go through. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Go ahead, Tina. Um, A proud graduate of UOG. Yes, I am. I'm alumni. Yay. Um, my name is Trina Lever. I'm the director of the Pacific Division for the Nature Conservancy, which is um, one of the world's largest conservation organizations. Uh, the work that I oversee is across Micronesia, so Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands, but also Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. And we have support staff in an office in Brisbane as well, Brisbane, Australia. Uh, we focus primarily on, um, we're a science-based organization, so we try to bring the best available science and tools and innovations. And, and we like to work at all levels. So we work um, with the communities on the ground. We're working with the, the managers in the, in the middle, sort of, and, the, and ministries and presidents and governors and, and traditional leadership and really trying, and even across the region in um, regional initiatives like the Micronesia Challenge or the Parties to the Now Agreement. We have three focus areas um, for the Pacific. We focus on this idea, which is truly built in the foundations of the cultures of the Pacific, with this idea of ridge to reef 
management and planning and, and really looking at um, whole systems of watersheds and out to the reef. And then sustainable fisheries as well is a really important component of our work. And finally, one of the, the really large problems that everyone is facing that really does, it will really impact our ability to be sustainable is climate change and the impacts that, we can, that we're currently experiencing in various islands and then those that we can anticipate. So I was just lucky enough to come back from Chuuk last night um, where we had a closing workshop where we were working across um, the four of the countries, Papua New Guinea, Palau, FSM, and Marshalls, um, working with 10 sites, uh, six of them watershed sites and four of them atoll sites, and really trying to bring the best available tools and science to, to work with communities, but also learn from them. And that's where I think, um, sometimes gets lost is the fact that there's a lot of incredible knowledge already there. And so working with the um, communities and really learning, what did you used to do during times of drought? What did you used to do in storms? What do you do now? How do you make your community more resilient to these big impacts that, might, um, that are coming very soon? And how do you uh, ensure food security, ensure water security. How do you diversify your livelihoods so that you have the, these natural resources that you depend on are, are healthy and also resilient to these big changes and they will um, sustain you into the future. So um, I think I'll stop there and, and wait for questions. Alpha D. Uh, my name is Walter Leonero. I'm the administrator of Guam EPA. Um, President Underwood, I sure wish I went before Senator Attic. He took all my talking points, but that's okay. Um, what one that uh, he that um, I want to point out is um, I've been attending the AWWA uh, meetings uh, the last two days. Some of the things that were brought uh, up is new science to try to determine um, <clears throat> our sustainability of our aquifer, which is very very important for the island of Guam. It's it supplies 80% of our water, drinkable water, um, and the other 20% comes from the southern side on surface waters. Um, but with the incoming military buildup, uh, current science we have uh, is sufficient and is, is approved for what we're doing. But then there's a new, new science that's coming up that's talking about you know possible raises of uh, sea levels and droughts and other things that we maybe need to start looking into uh, because you know most people when they think about uh, sea level rise they think about using the coastal lands well having a sole source aquifer like we do on Guam if the sea level rise increases and that also pushes the water our fresh water and ends up so we also will reduce our sole source aquifer if that occurs so there's, those are kind of some of the things that we have to look at besides some of the other issues that um, Senator Adam mentioned, but I do want to tell, tell, talk about a story which kind of reflects what the keynote speaker had mentioned about starting from the foundation. Uh, so as a young kid growing up on Guam, um, having breakfast with the family, a family of seven kids in our family, you know, eggs, coffee, toast, or rice, and um, not knowing what we were doing at the time, or at least not for myself, Watching my mom in the breakfast, and after breakfast done, taking the eggshells, taking the coffee grinds, uh, using the gantry can, which is either a metal can from the coffee or, or from a chorizo can, and, and putting it all in there, and then we digging holes and composting it. Not knowing that I was doing all these things that now we are trying to push people to do now. Um, Islanders pretty much have started things as, as a regular day-to-day -day life uh, lifestyle. Um, so, you know, like the keynote speaker had mentioned, you know, the foundation needs to be started from each individual person. When we do that, and we can assure each other and look at each other and say, yes, we're all getting there, then it's easier for the individuals to group together and make the sustainability happen as a, as a group. And then the group can continue on to be larger and larger, and sooner or later, we'll have the island doing it. And um, that was the premise of why I was talking about myself, even though I love talking about myself all the time. It was, it was, a, it was really a lesson for you guys to hear. That we really do a lot of things that people don't understand or didn't realize, you know, composting, recycling, 
uh, in just our day-to-day -day -day things, especially the elder, uh, you know, the Tremolos that grew up before us. Just, uh, unfortunately, we're becoming a throwaway community, and we need to go back to our roots. And again, um, I, I, with that, I'll leave it. Um, I'll wait for the questions. Thank you very much. Today, my name is Al Borja. I am the Environmental Director for Marine Corps Activity Guam. Uh, I am a NAFAC, uh, NAFAC employee, um, so that is my parent command. Um, I've been, you know, I've, I've graduated from the University of Guam, and that has left so much, um, so much impact on my life in terms of understanding what our specific needs are for this island and. Um, and actually being part of the process of analyzing impacts from military actions. Um, I, I think it's an expression of social responsibility when, you know, when the U.S. Congress basically tells federal agencies, you must do these things before you actually carry out your actions, have a well-considered decision uh, before, um, before you uh, actually proceed with uh, any, any type of development, whether it's a small one or a big one. Um, listening to the folks that are uh, joining us here at the panel, uh, I'm, I'm also cognizant that there's, there's a regulatory aspect to our environmental sustainability. We are, um, you know, the law demands that we follow certain rules in terms of conducting ourselves in our projects. Um, but there is also the need to adapt to uh, changing conditions, and that's why we have sometimes legislative solutions to some, some, of, our, some of our issues. And I see, you know, once, once something is legislated and passed into law, that doesn't necessarily mean that we stop, you know, stop considering other solutions that potentially, you know, may be more culture based, you know, um, whereby like what the, you know, what Walter was saying about, you know, doing something at the personal level. For example, my, my daughter, she loves tomatoes and um, I actually started like a backyard tomato, uh, tomato farm. So. I've been I've been growing these tomatoes, and I feel like I've been I've been closer to the land just by growing something. You know, and that's uh, I I should have done it earlier. I just started doing it just because my daughter loves it. But uh, uh, just being closer to the land and uh, understanding our specific cultural needs sometimes uh, enables us to make better decisions uh, when we're when we're doing development that is necessary for for our economy and what drives our island forward. Um, uh, I, I just, I'm just in awe of uh, you know, every, every, every aspect of uh, the discussions that we've heard earlier. I just, I just want to kind of absorb all that and make, uh, you know, in, in terms of planning for the future, you know, building alliances, those types of themes. Um, it, it reminds me of some of my conversations with Joe Moffness at the Division of Forestry, um, whereby we want to, you know, kind of work together. At, Gulf Guam, not a lot of people realize this, but Gulf Guam is um, actually taking a, a big lead in uh, establishing partnerships with federal federal and other agencies on island. Uh, I've, been, I've been in discussions with Joe Moffness about, um, you know, I, I think he, he wants to create um, uh, or, or formally designate conservation areas, and maybe that's under um, Senator Addis' purview. Um, but we want to participate in that, the DOD, uh, obviously has a budget for environmental stewardship, for conservation, for cultural preservation. We want to be a full participant in, the, in, this, in this great effort to push forward with sustainability uh, on the island. So I, I look forward to the, the dialogue and conversation moving forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Al. So uh, just um, let me ask you the uh, most important question. This is all to the entire panel. Do you guys love the University of Guam? <laughs> Let me ask you that. All right. Can you just nod your head yes? Uh, okay, all right. Okay. Do you think the University of Guam deserves more money? <laughs> all right, so, so Nico and uh, Walter, did you go to the UOG? Yeah. Okay, there you go. So I gave you- I also got my- PMBA. That's right. Yeah, 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 there you go. Please, please, please. I knew this panel was picked this way for a reason. <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's um, um, you know, and, and we, of course we always want to be positive. 
we always want to talk about partnerships and we want to talk about collaboration. Uh, but there's always uh, what, you know, I, I'm, I wouldn't call them disruptors, but there's certainly uh, players in this uh, arena. And so we have to kind of uh, think about it. And, and part of it is, uh, is piggybacking off the, uh, the um, uh, keynote address earlier, is trying to understand, you know, what is the role of uh, something like tourism in sustainability, you know? Uh, because our view of like how much water does an average tourist use a day, we're talking about water consumption, how much water, what, what do we do about that? And is there a kind of like you said that we're reaching a tipping point, Nico? Maybe, there, maybe we've already reached that tipping point. I remember, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, uh, the question was asked in the CIS conference, is two million too much, you know? And so, you know, that's, that's the question. And the other, of course, uh, 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 disruptor is, uh, is uh, military construction. Because, you know, it just brings, uh, it, there's an intensity to it and it's just going to uh, bring a new level of activity to this. And of course, there are always attempts to put uh, safeguards into that. But I wanted a chance for everybody to just reflect upon uh, tourism and and, uh, and, and uh, the military and and how they could be uh, you know, we, we kind of comprehend how they could be disruptors um, how can they be uh, well for lack of a better word less disruptive or or is that possible well, l let me start off first of all I uh, so I, I'm, I'm retired I retired from the military and so obviously my, my views are are pro military um, and and I, although some may look at the military build up here as a disruptive force or whatever, uh, the fact of the matter is that the upgrade of, of our ability to uh, treat our wastewater uh, up to the secondary level so that it has less of an impact when we discharge it out to the ocean uh, was really largely possible also by uh, uh, contributions from from the DOD as. as part of the uh, military buildup. Um, a lot of the renewable uh, power production uh, was also made possible um, as part of the military initiatives and whatnot. So, um, you know, to say that they're, um, to say that, that they're, they're, they're simply disruptors, I, I would disagree with that. Uh, we've, we've got a, um, our, our new solid waste uh, landfill uh, up at Lazon. Uh, certainly the military is a customer to that operation and if they weren't uh, the costs are of uh, our tipping fees will certainly be a lot greater and as a result I think we're going to result with uh, more illegal dumpings out of the ocean so I, 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 I do the military presence uh, differently. Uh, looking at the tourism uh, side of things you know we do last year we welcomed about 1.5 million tourists and you know that's 10 times our population on the island. So when you look at their, their footprint on, on the island, it's definitely something to consider, right, when we're looking at our environment. But I think the biggest thing that we can do, because they come for such a short period of time and we do get a lot of repeat visitors, especially from our Japanese market, is to better educate them in terms of their impact. And we do have certain campaigns like our Tourism Works that kind of shows how tourism dollars come in, where it gets put into, for example, the Guam Museum, and how it gets reinvested back into the community. So I think pushing that a step further and having more um, educational thing materials for the tourists will kind of help us in terms of their impact and their footprint on the island. Oh, I'll, I'll go ahead first. Um, so, so it's not just Senator Ada uh, speaking about the military. Um, but I, I do want to point out that, um, and, and using Dr. Underwood's terms about being less disruptive, um, I think that's built into the process, you know, in, in terms of following federal laws on uh, analyzing environmental impacts and um, devising ways to offset, mi uh, minimize, or avoid impacts um, when, we're, when we're analyzing our, our, um, our you know, for construction or new construction or operations. Um, and as a result of this analysis, it's required by the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, you reach out to the public, you reach out to stakeholders, 
um, and see what the concerns are uh, and then devise ways to actually um, you know, respond or address those impacts. Uh, good example about the Northern District Wastewater Treatment Plant, that is a mitigation, mitigation project identified in the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement. Uh, the, DO, the DOD advocated to Congress to release funding for the upgrade of the secondary, uh, upgrade of the Northern District Wastewater Treatment Plant to secondary treatment. The same process was used to unlock funds uh, from the uh, Maritime Administration to fund port improvements, uh, transportation mitigation projects from you know, Route 3 widening, Aganya Bridge replacement. Those are all DOD funded projects under the Defense Access Road Program. So there's, there's a distinct link from accurately analyzing impacts and then unlock, unlocking the resources to address those impacts. And we were talking about uh, potential for um, uh, responding or being adaptable to climate change, for example. Um, the, uh, the same pot of funding that went into the Northern District Wastewater Treatment Plant upgrade was also Department of Defense advocated funds uh, that went into the Northern Guamlands Aquifer uh, uh, rehabilitation of wells in addition, addition of monitoring wells so that we can better respond to drawdowns from, let's say, drought or other, other events that, that, may, that may be spurred by climate change. And that enables our um, water, water system operators to respond appropriately in terms of whether we can do uh, water exchanges or you know, uh, reducing the pump rates for some of our wells. Those tools that are required to be adaptable to, um, to events such as climate change are, are now going to be built and are going to be in place. Um, and I think those, those, types of, those types of infrastructure changes that, that really directly benefit the civilian community um, was, was really born out of this accurate analysis of impacts uh, from our supplemental environmental impact statement. So I, I really feel like the regulatory process is working and, and uh, it's be, you know, creating the solutions to be less disruptive as you put it, Dr. Ron. Walter? Yes. So um, I just agree with Senator and uh, Al about uh, all the money that's come in from DOD to upgrade uh, Guam's infrastructure. infrastructure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Infrastructure. Unfortunately, um, I've worked at Guam EPA for over 25 years, or roughly 25 years. I've, most of that time, it's been doing, overseeing uh, DOD cleanups from past mishaps. Now, Al has a perfect uh, statement saying that the the new regulations and laws keep them really in check. Um, but prior to that, when when they were here during the 40s and 50s and 60s. In the early 70s, there was no regulations. A lot of mishaps that occurred, which we're still chasing down and trying to clean up to ensure the safety for the public health and the environment. So that's still ongoing, and we still need the cooperation of DOD to continue to make sure that happens, and not just what their buildup is. Um, and um, that's a constant fight because most of the money, most of and most of the thought goes into our future. And people forget that sometimes ensuring our future is correcting the mishaps in the past. And that's a big thing that uh, doesn't get as much money as you build up or as much press. That's, that, that, those are things that I have to deal with, that the agency has to deal with. Team Palm EPA is always on, on board on trying to get these things to like, keep everybody safe. But uh, that's, the, that's the one thing I have to say, uh, President Wood, that uh, I would like to see a, a bigger um, bigger push by DOD to help us ensure get, getting all the past mishaps cleaned up. Well, you know, I mean, that, that just points up the formerly used defense sites, which are enormous and almost every, on almost every corner of the island, there's something that's buried or something that uh, was interacting with the environment that uh, we're unsure about. And I don't, you know, and, and obviously sometimes people are reticent to uh, create those studies, but let, let, let's let uh, let Trina talk on that. Just uh, how does a uh, how does an uh, NGO or how does an advocacy group uh, deal with issues not just here in Guam but perhaps regionally on, on tourism and and uh, their impact? Um, so I'll speak uh, mostly to tourism because that's where we've mostly been working, and and I'll um, echo the words of our the wonderful keynote um, this morning is uh, Palau has built it and it and. 
um, the Nature Conservancy has been working in the region since 1990, and we began working in Palau. And one of the things that we um, first started working with them on in 2005, there was a request by the, the president, who's currently the president, but was, was in his first term, um, to look at uh, what a sustainable financing plan and what would it take to um, uh, manage the protected areas network well. And so the initial green fee went into place and the Nature Conservancy helped to develop that and helped to develop the legislation for that and the um, protected areas network fund board um, to manage it. And so that originally was an additional $15. And then there was a, re a recognition that um, with new tourists coming in and with the use of the protected areas networks increasing, there would be more hotels and infrastructure and that there needed to be an additional fee that would go towards things like water and sewage and infrastructure. So then an additional sort of brown fee was put on top, another $15. And then when um, a couple of years ago when the president announced at, and the legislature passed the National Sanctuary Act, then an additional fee to help manage that. So I think it's really trying to build in up front that, that idea of user pays, like that if, that if people are going to come and enjoy Palau or if people are going to come and enjoy Guam, they should be giving back. They should help to um, improve the infrastructure. They should green help fees. to manage. Green fees. green fees. Green fees, user green. fees, exactly. And that's been used in Belize, in Costa Rica, Seychelles, and other places as well. Um, another area that the Nature Conservancy more recently has been getting into, and we just worked in um, Cancun, um, in Mexico, on is helping you to ensure natural infrastructure to protect things like hotels, big investments on land. So the, for the first time, we were helped to structure with Swiss Re um, insurance for the coral reefs off the coast of Cancun to protect the tourist investments. And so those are some other potentially pulling in new industries to really think about how do we manage the systems more holistically for growth, but also recognizing maybe two million is too much. Maybe, maybe there is a carrying capacity that we need to um, bear in mind. So yeah, since you raised the uh, the issue of or the example of Palau, which was you know sternly presented here earlier, particularly the Palau letter, and and even the the activities of President Romengasau, uh, those um, you know it, it's interesting. I think how that relates to Guam. Uh, Palau is an independent nation, so they don't need federal regulations in order to be. Uh, uh, far thinking, and in order to be protective of uh, their environment. Uh, Guam, on the other hand, uh, we're a U.S. territory, so federal laws apply, and so we're kind of caught in this, um, I, I'm not sure what it is exactly, how we relate to federal regulations. We scream and holler when we don't like them, and then we use them to beat each other up when we do like them, or we disagree with somebody, you know, so Inevitably, we, we have a kind of a, a love-hate relationship with federal regulation, you know, so um, uh, it's not personally directed at you, Al, but, uh, <laughs> but, but there is a kind of, a, and, and, and my comments about the military and tourism being disruptive is, is, not, is, is uh, not necessarily talking about whether it's disruptive in a positive or negative way, it's just the scale of these activities are inherently uh, life shaping, economy shaping, and so that's the, that that's what I meant by that. But I, I just wanted, uh, you know, federal regs um, as they ap apply now look to be on the side of sustainability. Uh, you know, I have uh, I'm I'm still a little concerned about having a, a, what I tried to refer to earlier as a sustainability sustainability development index. How do we know that? What what is the measurement that we're using? And the measurement that we're using now is, uh, you know, the federal law demands it, and uh, whatever the wisdom of Congress, which is really frightening, whatever the wisdom of Congress has determined <laughs> is the basis for our sustainability development index, that's what we're stuck with. So I know Walter is, uh, you know, he's like the, uh, the, the guy who enforces this, and he has to kind of respond to it on, on both sides. But if you could just, uh, before we open it up, just speak to the issue of how 
federal regulations are helpful or not helpful? Walter, you're, you're on the cutting edge of that. Right. <laughs> well, um, wow, that's, that's a tough question. Um, the federal regulations, they set a good standard. Um, unfortunately, as you mentioned, President, that um, these regulations are written by Congress. Uh, that's in DC, which is thousands and thousands of miles away. Um, they don't exactly focus in on our, our specific areas of concern for Guam. Uh, Guam is not like DC or California or you know, let alone the few landlocked uh, states that they have. We have a lot of site-specific issues that are not always addressed in, in the federal law. Um, in fact, a lot of federal law I've seen that had exemptions like for Puerto Rico and Hawaii and Alaska, they forget about Guam. And that inhibits our capability to do it. Um, again, it's, it's a good basis and um, that's why uh, our Guam EPA now is in, in the process of trying to strengthen our, our local regulations and statutes, and update them so that they meet the demands of what Guam needs to be. But, uh, I guess it's, 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 a, it's a good foundation. Do, do, you, do you ever see a time where Guam regulations would actually exceed federal regulation? Yes. The, but so what, what the basis of uh, federal uh, regulations, especially for, well, and I speak only on the environmental side of the world, is uh, you know, we either have to match or be more stringent than the federal regulation as a territory of the United States. So, um, Quite often, we do have certain things that are more stringent than the other, so that they're, they're more applicable to Guam and and the, the, the circumstances we have. Here. Try to skirt them. I get it. Well, I I you know certainly um, the. Even in my former life, when I worked for the Guam Department of Agriculture for many years um, in the fishery section, and then I was um, acting chief of the division, there again it was a kind of that user pays user benefits model, and so we did benefit greatly from some federal regulations like the um, uh, Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Act and, and things like that. I, I so so I think there can you know definitely there can be. Tremendous benefits. One of the examples following on to the green fees that um, Guam and CMI are challenged by because they're protectors of the US is um, not being able to collect those things at the airport because of the airport bonds and it, all the money has to stay through the airport. And so, so finding creative ways to um, work within that system has been a bit of a challenge. But I, I do think, you know, certainly um, things like the uh, U.S. Endangered Species Act has, has created some tremendous benefits by calling attention to climate change, by using that particular tool to try to get people to understand that climate change is also a threat and CO2 is a threat, but it can also, you know, hinder then when people are trying to do, um, uh, for example, in the case of corals uh, being put on the list, it was a kind of the wrong tool for, for that. So. So I definitely, I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't have any um, silver bullet other than I think that it's helpful for NGOs to help local governments and to help in, in advocacy in um, federal government to make sure that the laws are doing what they're intended to do and are, are not hurting or harming communities and not being, you know, not um, having unintended consequences. Um, but that, you know, there definitely have been some tremendous benefits. Want to speak to that, Senator? Yeah. I, I think uh, federal regulations can become very disadvantageous when it becomes uh, an unfunded mandate. Um, but um, you know, like in our case of the the, power, the Guam Power Authority, um, they were they'll be facing if they to correct the problems with the power plant down at Cabras. Uh, I think the retrofit to that was going to cost twice the amount that it will cost to might as well build a new power plant that's uh, going to be EPA compliant. Uh, and so as a result, that comes back to all of us as consumers because now GPA is going to have to go out and borrow 
uh, from the bond market to build a new power plant, then you know our power rates may have to go up uh, so that they can pay for those things. So in that regard, uh, it certainly would be um, disadvantageous. I've also seen where federal regulations are used as the you know, when the political will is not here to do the right thing, it's kind of like, well, we got to do it because the Fed says we have to do it, and that becomes the crutch. And then we you tell know. on each other. So he's a bad guy. <laughs> Want to speak to that, huh? Just, just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the federal federal regulations, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, they're, they're applicable to Guam. But I, I think there's, there is some wisdom from Congress and, and there's, there's what they call waivers of sovereign immunity, whereby they, they, they say that, you know, if the state has a specific requirement that is attached or that is aligned with this particular federal law, you can actually, the federal agencies must follow the state or territorial requirements. So uh, in the case of uh, uh, Guam EPA, for example, the Safe Drinking Water Act, that's a federal statute, but there's a lot of Guam specific requirements that are under um, territorial regulations that we that are more stringent and we do follow. Um, for example, we have significant uh, water recharge areas on top of our northern, northern Guam lens aquifer that there are special protections for those recharge areas under our local regulations. And I think that's that's smart because it's it's a it's a site specific condition and it's a critical resource for the island. And so um, I, I think there there is some you know federal influence obviously, but I think there there is also some local responsibility for making sure that if we do have a, a resource specific uh, issue that we uh, legislate and um, and actually have a solution for it in our in our in our territorial regulation. I, I, I would also urge that uh, you know especially uh, you out in, in uh, your own work uh, to the extent that you can that you you know facilitate the utilization of uh, of local research power in, in uh, carrying out these studies because uh, you know we're always concerned particularly at the University of Guam we're always concerned that uh, you know uh, the, uh, the, the the people that are contracted to conduct these studies uh, they come from off island, they don't have that level of sensitivity. May I respond to that? Sure. Okay. Please. So, can you give a percentage of how much of those contracts? <laughs> <laughs> well, not not in those terms, but you know, so so Congress had the wisdom of uh, passing the Sykes Act, and that essentially enabled the uh, federal agencies to carry out their conservation work uh, through federal, state, and um, uh, non nonprofit agencies, for example. And actually, the University of Guam has been a beneficiary of that, of that uh, mandate uh, through the, what we call the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with the, uh, with the University of Guam and its individual uh, groups. And um, we're looking forward to actually expanding that because we just got a uh, clarifying memo from the Office of the Secretary of Defense last year Basically, it says that as long as the uh, you know the the federal, state, or nonprofit agency has the interest and the capability that that we that we have to prioritize our work through those those entities. So I I feel that there will be an increasing trend in the future, um, all, you know, of of work being done through our local local partners. Well, there you go, scientists, fans out there. You heard it here. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 I just wanted to just uh, kind of, and, and we'll take one or two questions, but just to kind of wrap up the, uh, the notion of how we relate to federal partners. I mean, it, it is a complicated um, uh, policy matter. So, you know, I can, I, I'm, you know I'm, I'm drawn to the fact of the application of the Endangered Species Act and the creation of the Wildlife Refuge, which is, uh, you know, I was never a big fan of, and uh, so that that was that happened. So people asked me, "What do I think about it?" I said, "You know what the difference is between fish and wildlife and Department of Defense holding that property?" I said, "What?" I said, "Fish and wildlife is forever. That's the difference." <laughs> and so you know, you you actually could you actually will find it easier in some situations to work with uh, DOD because uh, even though they they hold certain properties, they hold them for very limited purposes. Uh, but on the other hand, the government of Guam was totally derelict with the uh, Oddred landfill. 
And had, had the federal government not stepped in and sued uh, one governor after another, uh, we'd still be building uh, Mount Otbud over there. And uh, you know, that's, that's also another sign of that this is a push and pull situation. And I appreciate you mentioned the Cooperative Ecosystems Unit, uh, what's commonly called CISUs, which, you know, which, which we've done a lot of business with, with individual researchers in Guam. But I do want to point out that it actually took me two visits to the Pentagon about five or six years ago in order to create that opportunity because when we were first inquiring about it, they said, no, we don't do CISUs on Guam with uh, local. So, so uh, there, there, it's, a, it's a lesson in, in constant advocacy and, uh, and, and constant intelligent advocacy and then at the end of the day, willing partners like you out. So I appreciate it very much. So now we'll go to a couple of questions. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, you take all the time you want. You got it, thank So uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not like uh, DOD with uh, deep pockets and, and give you guys a lot of money. But we work closely with Weary, and they are a key component in, in our studies on, on our aquifer and, and the drinkable water for the residents and the tourists and the military of Guam. And so I, I would be remorse to not say Dr. Jensen is an outstanding member of your faculty, and uh, me and him work well. We meet uh, constantly, and uh, we're trying to make things sure the things are working well. Well, that uh, it's a very important, and that's a, a partnership that goes back to the Guam Legislature too, appropriating money for Weary. Uh, Weary is uh, one of the most significant activities that we have at the University of Guam. I don't think people understand how complicated that is, and how uh, how. Uh, truly sacred water is on this island and how important it is to our lives. So, uh, that's important. So we'll go to questions. All right. Anybody have any questions? Hope I knew you'd have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Who has the mics? We have, uh, we'll have three questions. Uh, we only have a few minutes, so we'll go to former Senator Hope and then we'll go to Dr. Galabi and then Dr. Selman. Um, I'm really happy that there are a lot of young people in the audience uh, because a very simplistic view has just been shared about uh, sustainability and, uh, and I, uh, there's a danger to a simplistic view of the military and the local um, partnerships here. And, um, you know, I'm... Every year we conduct this uh, soil and water conservation symposium for educators in order to educate our educators on content matters because we're trying to connect to the STEM curriculum and we're trying to build up our capacity to teach uh, our little ones. And, uh, and, and so this year our theme is our water, our home. And I think it speaks well to island sustainability. And so I'm here basically to try and harness as much information as I can and speakers and presenters uh, for our, sympo our three-day symposium. Um, but um, all of you have talked about um, water, for example. I know that um, the Northern Guam Lens Aquifer has over 140 water wells. And uh, I also know that there are over 150 contaminated sites from Superfund sites to um, installation restoration projects, IRPs, as well as FUDs, formerly used defense sites. And most of these sites have not been cleaned up, basically because for the CERCLA, uh, you need congressional appropriation. And we don't have that political clout there, and so we're not able to draw that money uh, out of there. But um, I'm kind of disturbed by the fact that uh, military money is going to solve some of these problems. Had not the military planned on using the new landfill, we would not have gotten DOD money for Lajon, which was a pristine, a watershed area, and now it's converted into a landfill. Had not the military plan to have over 10,000 flushes a day, 
who would not have a northern uh, wastewater treatment, secondary treatment plant. So, it, you know, these DOD monies that are coming down do not come down because of, uh, you know, sheer sympathy uh, of the island's people. We have contaminations that we have to deal with now. Cancer is our number two killer on this island, and I highly suspect that they're coming from contaminated areas. So, you know, I'm, I just would like to okay. consider Senator, that. Senator, is there a question in there? Or? No, I have a comment. That was it. Thank All you. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, Dr. Gulabi, I hope you have a question. <laughs> Landfill and waste management was mentioned a few times and in fact the question regarding the water contamination and all that. So uh, I want to ask a question about the landfill. I, but before uh, I ask the question, as you all know, uh, I'm kind of got the, uh, my name on, I always make a little very short story before my question. And uh, that is uh, about the uh, landfill. I teach several courses at the University of Guam and um, soil sciences, uh, plant sciences, and waste management and other courses, except language, that's why I still have uh, action. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, one of my courses that I teach is the waste management. And part of that, I always take my students to the landfill and to the waste water treatments every year. And I teach them about it. And every time I go to the landfill, I have a big discussions with the managers and supervisors there. And I'm asking them that what they are doing actually is not according to what it should be. Of course, I'm thinking about it or I'm looking at it from the scientific point of view. But even uh, besides that, from the practical point of view, they do a lot of things that is not environmentally friendly. I'll give you some example. A landfill, is supposed to have a cell. And of course the definition of cell is different from what they say and what we see in the, or what we define in the academic uh, uh, world. Uh, a cell is supposed to be covered every day with the soil, with at least two feet of soil. So whatever you have of the waste during that day, that should be impacted, impacted and then covered with two feet of soil. And then uh, go home and then come back next day, start adding it. Now, in this of doing that, what they do, they fill the uh, uh, cell and then they cover it with a top. Well, when you do that, then you have a um, heat, of course warm is warm, you have a lot of rain, and you, again, then you have a, you create a uh, anaerobic condition and then a lot of microbial activity. And then in the morning, they come in and uncover the tarp, and then the villagers complain about the smell. And I actually wrote an article about it, and uh, those villagers, they, they say, especially in the morning, we, he, we have this smell, we cannot open the window. Well, the smell comes from the landfill because they undo the uh, uh, tarp, and then all that uh, gas that is generated during that time. Dr. Galabi, can you get to your question? So, yeah. So that's one thing that, uh, how come that they do not know a very simple thing? The other thing is that the, the cell is already being filled and they're talking about building another cell and actually 12 cells and each cell uh, I think cost a lot while, uh, while they could only have one big landfill instead of having so many cells. So I believe that the Guam is gonna have a major problem with the landfill in future and already have a major problem with the, with the landfill regarding the environment and contamination, not only the air, but also the water around the area. Thank you. So my question basically is how do you deal with that? <laughs> I think since we're short on time and, and not skirting the question, um, I have some staff that runs our solid waste uh, program and we could definitely talk to you on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The staff that the, the solid waste team that we have, they're very, very, very good at what they do. They, they have national uh, credentials. Um, they, they go out and we, we try to ensure that all the regulations are met. Um, like most other government agencies, even though um, some people think the government is, is a fat cat, we, we are way understaffed. We have 
50 people that basically regulate this island. And for a solid waste <coughs> program, we have three and, and one in recycle, uh, specifically for recycling. So um, again, what I would propose is that we can look after this and we can tell you exactly how we oversee the receiver who's operating and managing the landfill and how we how the rules are our regulations stand. Yeah, uh, we also have an expert here from uh, on, on solid waste as well from the South Pacific Regional Environmental Program who's attending the conference. Dr. Salman, you'll be the last uh, questioner. Yes, I'm terribly sorry to be between you and lunch. Um, so let me get right to the point. You all seem to be locked into the anthropocentric model, which proposes that we're going to protect the environment because it's going to benefit human beings. It's particularly going to bring us um, economic benefit. What I'd like to ask you is, have you heard of ecofeminism? Have you heard of the idea that the liberation of women is intimately tied to the liberation of the environment, that women's rights are tied to environmental rights? Do you think that's useful? Do you think you can enact something along those lines, or do you think that just muddies the water? Thank you. Great I'll question. Start. I'll start. <laughs> It is a great question, and in fact, um, we have a, a really um, strong gender program in, uh, in our Pacific Island um, program for the Nature Conservancy, where we've been working um, with several women's groups in m many of the islands. And I'll use, for example, I'll take us outside of Micronesia and use an example in the Solomon Islands, where um, we've been working with um, women from three communities formed an organization called Kawaki, and it's the first um, initials of each of the villages. And um, they, in fact, the big issue that they were worried about coming to their country is mining. And they were very concerned about what that would mean to their families, knowing that um, often it's the men who would make the decision to say, yeah, let's get some money, economic development here. And, and so one of the things that the Conservancy did is say, um, you, you know, the decision making is yours, but we will try to help you have the best available information on mining impacts. And, you know, we brought in some women from um, Bougainville in Papua New Guinea where they had mining and some of the impacts. And so it was women to women talking about it, and then they served as the... Uh, um, the, the awareness, they would go out and talk to the, the members of the community about these are the impacts, these are the things that could happen, these are the potential benefits, so that everybody at least had the best available information. Now we're working with the Kowaki women to do, um, they, we've brought um, several folks in to help the, train them in ecotourism because there's a great, um, the Arnhem Islands, which the communities share, um, has the, um, uh, a large rookery for hawksbill sea turtles, and so we want to help them to create a small ecotourism venture in that area. So I firmly believe that yes, absolutely, uh, the key to getting a lot of really important, uh, the key to really looking at sustainability really does go through the women. And we, we've definitely tapped that incredible power. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, how about a round of applause for the panel? I will save my longtime colleague, uh, Senator Adda, from responding to the question about echo feminism. <laughs> Thank you so much.